Um, the next speaker, by the way, is somebody who I had the pleasure to talk to quite a bit um, from early 2020 onwards. Um, we talked a lot about models, projections, peaks, troughs, and plateau, as everybody really struggled to understand where COVID was going and where the pandemic was going, because at the time, um, he established and co-chaired TAG, which is the technical advisory group in the Welsh Government coordinating the pan uh, pandemic response. Today, I'm glad to say he won't be talking so much about that, uh, rather talking about developing a life, life sciences plan for Wales and how government institutions, charities and many others can work together to achieve that. And I think if there is a bit of time at the end, you wouldn't be averse to taking a few questions, Rob, if that's okay. Um, so please welcome Dr. Rob Orford, Chief Scienti Scientific Advisor for Health in Wales. Ah, Borida, thank you. Let's, uh, let's take, get the B reel out of the way, is it? Uh, if anybody wants a picture, I'll uh, snap this to you. <laughs> I've got kids. Okay, let's get this out of the way, right? This is the biggest screen I've ever seen. I would just love to sit there and watch the rugby on Saturday <laughs> on this. Anybody going to watch the rugby? Yeah. Are we going to win? Yeah. Yes. Come on. So uh, before I begin, I would really, really like to thank the organisers. I work closely with colleagues in Healthcare Research Wales, and they are phenomenal. Ph I can't say it. They're amazing. They're really good. Thank you ever so much for the invite. Uh, I think I may have mistold uh, what I was going to talk about. I said I was going to talk about life sciences, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about life instead. So the theme of this conference is about people in research, which is good because you are people and you are in research. And so it's saying that we should all identify with people. I don't get out much, unfortunately. I spend a lot of my time in my loft with my quill and parchment writing my public inquiry statements, which is not much fun. So uh, it's very good to be here to see real people. I thought I'd make the most of today and stick around for a bit. I know I don't look my age of 329. Once upon a time, I was young. I had more hair on the top of my head than my face and in my ears. And in my younger days, I was a researcher, an active researcher. I was employed to understand how small things work, and it was a joyous period of my life and my career. That feeling of finding something new, that feeling of publishing a paper with your name on it, that feeling of opening that grant letter with the award that you've won. That was great. But it wasn't all highs. Science is drip, drip. Right? I remember the papers that didn't get published, the awards that I didn't win. And perhaps most importantly, the most important lasting memory I have of that period are the people that I worked with, the colleagues that I collaborated with, who became my friends. They were the people I would commiserate with or celebrate with. They were the people who would reach out and remind me that Wales had lost the rugby again very kind of them and it's my opinion that life is best experienced with other people so look around you all of these wonderful people here one day they might be your colleagues they might be your collaborators and they might even be your friends so take the opportunity today to talk to people so in science and in research collaboration is deeply good and communication is key we achieve more if we work together. We're effective if we tell people about the new knowledge that we've learned or the evidence that we created and how it can help them resolve their problems. So collaborate and communicate with people. This is good. And we like to talk about people too. We love to gossip. And that's good because it shows that we're interested and that we care I don't know if anybody has heard recently, there's this uh, infection kicking around called COVID. You may have known one or two people that have had it. I suspect everybody here knows somebody currently that's had it recently. A friend of mine texted on one of the WhatsApp groups. This wasn't a work WhatsApp group that will be published in the public inquiry. And he said, oh my God, I got COVID again. This is seven times, seven times. And to demonstrate this, he sent us the picture of his lateral flow test. <laughs> And my other friend said, that means control. He'd had weeks and weeks off work. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever had COVID. 
So that's the thing, right? We like to talk about health. And we showed how important we think health is in the way in which we acted or reacted to the pandemic. The way in which we gave up our liberties and our freedoms to protect others and to protect ourselves from the worst of the disease. So we talk about health a lot, certainly Owen does. Every day, there's something in the media, something generally bad about the NHS, about waiting lists, about industrial action, and sometimes there's good about new innovations, new treatments. So recently, my team in Welsh Government, called Science Evidence Advice, worked very closely with colleagues in Healthcare Research Wales Evidence Centre. Is there anyone here from the Evidence Centre? Yay! And Public Health Wales. Anyone from Public Health Wales? Yay! Okay, one or two. Fantastic. And so we were commissioned by Welsh Government to write a report about the health of the people of Wales, the people in our communities, the people that we work with, and the people that we love and care for. They asked us what the health of the nation will look like in 10 or so years' time and what it would mean for our NHS when she turns 85. So we're asked this question so Welsh go government could see whether its policies, its strategies, its plans were pointed in the right direction and whether our assets of the NHS and the social care system are pointed and aligned with what comes next. And it was debated on Tuesday in the Senate and it was a wonderful debate and I would encourage you to go on Senate TV and, and re-watch it. And it was covered by all of the main media outlets ITV, uh, Radio, Morning Star, Wales Online, South Wales Echo, all the main ones. <laughs> and I think we could probably all take an educated guess what the report says. And if I'm, there we go, my one of two slides that I'm able to show, if you take your phones, the QR code should tunnel you through into that rather than my holiday pictures. And it says that we live in an aging society. There's no surprise there. And it's highly likely that the prevalence of various diseases and conditions like dementia, diabetes, some cancers, musculoskeletal conditions will increase over time. 32% of the population currently have MSK, with 17% of them being long-term. For conditions like cancer and dementia, that's the consequence of people living longer. There'll be an increase of people living with two or more long-term conditions, and there'll be a about a doubling of people living with four long-term conditions. And many of those people will have um, mental health problems being one of them. And for those people with four or more um, long-term conditions, they'll have at least one outpatient appointment a month. And some of these conditions are likely to increase faster than we might expect in our aging population, like dementia, heart failure, osteoporosis, chronic heart disease, asthma, hypertension, anxiety disorders, and diabetes. And diabetes alone is projected to rise by 22%, which will affect 260,000 people in Wales alone. And many of these conditions are preventable. Obesity is projected to rise itself, being a risk factor for many long-term conditions like diabetes, dementia, and hypertension. And we know from the evidence that every pound invested in public health at a local level will give a four pound return plus your pound back. And at a national level, this is higher. We know that people living in disadvantaged areas will live and are likely to live with multiple chronic conditions at a younger age. And the differences in life expectancy is stark with people from more disadvantaged areas living eight to nine years less long than those in more advantaged areas. And importantly, they'll spend more of their life in ill health, with 22 years of their later life in ill health, compared to 13 in more affluent areas. So the evidence tells us we need to focus on prevention, and the evidence tells us that we need to address social and health inequalities. It also tells us that we have to diagnose earlier it says we have to treat people as a whole person and that we need to do more for people closer to their homes in the communities. None of this is new and others like the Health Foundation, Public Health Wales, Bevan, say the same thing. What else do we know? We know actually that a big, uh, a significant proportion of people 
that are off work or economically inactive are because of long-term conditions which impacts the prosperity and resilience of Wales. Our workforce are aging. You are aging. So we have to look after the workforce because the proportion of adults of working age to retired age is decreasing significantly over time. And we have the rise of precision medicine, AI, and robotics. All of these will undoubtedly impact on health. Is that the answer? Well, uh, you tell me. You are the evidence creators, the scientists, the researchers. They are our problems. How will we address them? How can we change course? One thing that's clear to me is that we need to work together and we can't expect the NHS or the public to do all of the lifting. Everyone will need to play their part. Health and care system, the public sector, charities, industry, and the public, we will all need to work together, as we did during the pandemic. Have you not sat there feeling like you're getting old? And I hope you don't feel that this is hopeless, because it's not. This is a tractable problem. Getting old doesn't mean need to mean getting unwell. And we can change health trends because we've done it before. Whether that's people dying from communicable diseases, people dying in childbirth or children dying. These are things that we've changed. But we all, all people, need to invest in this idea. And we need to use evidence, research, and innovation to illuminate the way. Thank you. We have time for questions, I think. Yes, I am right, about five minutes. Um, so there's a lot to think about there, some scary projections, but also not an intractable uh, problem uh, and issues, as, Ro as Rob alluded to. Um, so any hands up for questions in the room? Oh, that's fantastic. We've not had coffee yet, so maybe that'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> can I ask one, then? Oh, of course. Um, I'm glad you were in the echo talking about it yesterday. Um, so it had um, its attention. But, you know, we, we do look about these scary projections. You know, the pressure's bad now, could get even worse. Um, you talk about it's not about the population doing the heavy lifting, nor the NHS. It's about everybody. In terms of specifically about research, how do you see that being part of the mix? And how do you get the more, most bang out of your buck then, in terms of the capability within this room and elsewhere to deal with those mounting pressures? That's a great, that's a great question. And uh, fortunately for me, Paul Nurse has done a review on what we're doing in the research landscape. And essentially that says, boil down your problems and focus them. We have enormous assets out there. Uh, the university sector in the UK is so powerful and we just need to bring the beam together so I think agreeing those strategic objectives, agreeing where we think most value would be added, and going after them together, as we did in the pandemic. Yeah, we have a hand up, I think, in the corner. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> um, we've got roving mics, I presume. Just down here towards the edge. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Tony. Uh, I am actually working with the Evidence Centre. Um, so my question is, I, I've got a biomedical science background, so I'm in research, I've grown up with it, but now I can't, so I do public involvement engagement. But um, do you think that the missing link between all the research and all the evidence is the social bit. Is that the glue that we need to start working on? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We, we, we say co-production, it's easy to say and difficult to do, but the behavioral science we showed during the pandemic, it's so, so important to understand uh, what people want, how, how do we uh, enable people to make the right decisions. Uh, it, it, it's fundamentally important. Thank you. Uh, because I did spot you earlier on, I will get 
to you. So if the mic can come down the stairs just to the corner um, here, and we'll take one more question, I think. Mike's going to be doing a lot of steps today. <laughs> we should sponsor him. Yeah. There um, we go. Sue Denman from Together for Change. Um, I think that you really put your finger on it when you said that prevention is key and partnership working is crucial. We're all in it together. Now, I'm one of the older people who you referred to <laughs> earlier on. And I just wonder, we've been talking about shifting resources toward prevention for the last 50 years, and it hasn't happened um, really, in my view. Uh, public health has been, you know, at a practical level, has been decimated in the UK. And it seems to me that partnership working isn't working either. So I wondered what your solutions are to tackling those really big challenges that we seem to fail to um, address year after year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really fair point. And as a system and as a government, we're really good at focusing on the problem in hand um, demand capacity, uh, ambulances waiting outside hospitals, the, the real operational challenges, and we find it less easy trying to get into the future. And we often discount the future in those decisions about what we fund. I mean, I hope that we use evidence to light the way, that we say this is what the evidence is telling us, like we did in COVID. And, and I think that we have decision makers in Wales that are alert to that, they're engaged in that, um, and that's really what we can do as researchers is try and illuminate the way and, and be enlightened, um, not have this post-truth era that we see elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. Please show your appreciation, Winston, again.